Hi everyone, I'm Mike and this is the Sunday Art Show. In this video I'm going to take you through a plein air landscape painting of a pebble beach populated with lots and lots of people. So it's pretty chilly here in Exeter this weekend and I thought it would be nice to think back to warmer times. So this is a trip to the beach at Budley Salterton uh, on the south coast of Devon. And this was a, it doesn't really come across in the, in the little video clip I showed you, but it was a particularly busy day. Um, it was actually quite crowded, but for some reason it doesn't look quite that way uh, in, in, the, in the little video clip. Nevertheless, I've got my mixed media paper and I'm working with that just down flat. So just a pad of paper down flat on the pebbles. And I'm using interactive acrylic today. So interactive acrylics are the acrylic paint, which once touch dry, you can reactivate them by spraying them with water. And that allows you to blend them repeatedly by doing that over and over again, even if, even if they've dried, you know, three or four times. That said, um, I'm using these for the most part, just like normal acrylics today. Um, it's quite a hot day. And for this particular subject, I was just able to work reasonably quickly and just kind of blend as I went. So a little bit of uh, cerulean blue and a little bit of uh, white to pop in a nice bright blue summer sky. The initial drawing has been created using a blue watercolour marker, one of my favourite uh, drawing mediums. And I like that a lot because I can kind of move the lines around and hide them with the acrylic or blend them into the acrylic if need be. But at the same time, it gives me a nice bold line. So, you know, I, I can see what I'm up to basically. So, so far the drawing incorporates the distant cliffs, uh, the quite distinctive line of trees over to the left. And then although there are a lot of people, um, I'm going to ignore that guy in the foreground of my reference. Well, my, it's, it's the reference for you, bottom bottom left, but I'm actually painting from life. I'm just looking looking at the people down the beach. So that guy with kind of the yellow cooler uh, sat on the deck chair. I'm going to ignore him, um, but I have just indicated a couple of people, but I'm going to add a load more. So the idea for this painting is I wanted to kind of create the sense of heat and create a crowd without getting into the intricacies of drawing every single person in great detail. But while I've been chatting away there, you can see I'm just popping in a darker blue for that little patch of sea, which is off in the distance beyond the little kind of um, little spur of pebbles, which goes out into the sea on the right hand edge of the painting. So the way I tend to work is um, if I've got blue on the go for the sky, then I'll, I'll think to myself, okay, where else can I use a blue in the painting? So that's why I'm working in this way. It tends to, to minimize the amount of brush cleaning you need to do. And I just think it's quite an efficient way of thinking as well to just build things up all across the painting um, at the same time, basically. So we've got a slightly paler blue than the distant blue there for the little crescent of of uh, seawater that we can see peeking in from the left and I'm just blending that in with some white so I didn't I didn't spray it with water but I'm just working quickly enough that even on a on this hot day uh, I can do a, just a little bit of gentle blending so again when I'm doing landscapes if I typically start with the sky obviously blue, well not obviously blue, but you know, often blue, often blue. I've used blue for the water, so now I'm thinking to myself, okay, what other colours have we got out there which I could create by mixing this blue with something else? So that's why I'm going for the greens now. Um, and you can see I'm just blocking in the greenery on top of the distant cliffs. And especially when working plein air, um, you know, even on a on a calm, settled, sunny day like I've got here, you can probably tell from the footage um, there are clouds coming in and out because the lighting's changing. You can just see it lifted there, so it's suddenly got brighter. Um, 
So you've got to be fairly quick. So I do find that if I can avoid, you know, having to wash my brush out excessively, it does save me quite a bit of time. And having put that darker green down, I'm now coming in with a paler green. So I've added more cadmium yellow to the mix. So the colors I'm uh, in general using today are the cerulean blue, white, cadmium yellow, uh, ultramarine blue. I probably got some burnt umber on my palette, but I may not use that. And then alizarin crimson. So that's my you know, pretty standard palette, I would say. I do change it from time to time a little bit, sometimes just for fun or other times specifically to try something new. Um, but they're, they're my go to's, I would say. So while that paint is still wet, I'm just sort of blending in some even lighter color. And by blending and working quickly, it creates nice soft edges and nice soft transitions from perhaps a brighter patch of field like I'm putting in now over to the right where it goes to a more, more of a green. And that tends to create a more natural blend, something you would see in nature compared to if you put a hard edge, a hard boundary between those two patches of tone and color. Now you can see I'm just painting right across the top of the trees and the trunks of the trees in the background. Um, with the watercolor marker I've put down, the line work I've put down, although, although it will move a little bit with me working the brush across it, there'll be enough left that I can see where my drawing was. And, and that's really all I need, you know, just a little bit of an indication. So we've got sky blocked in, we've got water blocked in, and now we've got distant landscape mostly blocked in, certainly in terms of the greenery on the fields. Now there is some shrubbery, uh, possibly a few small trees, bushes, things like that, uh, up on top of the cliff, but I'm not worrying about drawing those precisely. I've just come in with a darker green, added more blue to the mix, possibly a little bit of the crimson. And uh, I'm just kind of working my brush in pretty much a random way to hint at those things, you know, hint at the, the kind of the organic random growth of a hedgerow rather than trying to draw a hedge. So you can hear in the background there's a, there's a group of guys who are uh, you know, being noisy, but it kind of added to the atmosphere, to be honest with you. So that's the great thing about the beach, I think, is that, you know, sometimes you can go down there and it's completely deserted when you expect it to be busy. And it's just quiet and serene. Um, but on this particular day, as I said, quite a lot going on. It was quite noisy, a lot of chat, a lot of people having a great time. And you know, I want to capture something of that busyness in the painting eventually. The pebbles are generally pretty good, though, in terms of being a plein, plein air painter, because a you get less sand and stuff, you know, on the on the on the painting, and you know there's less danger of getting sand in the palette. But also, there are generally speaking, you know, fewer dogs and children and balls flying around on a pebble beach, so um, you tend to be left alone a little bit more. Not not that I mind people approaching me and having a chat. Um, in fact, that happened last summer uh, down in Cornwall. And, you know, generally people are very cool and just interested in what you're up to. But uh, um, but it's generally speaking a lot calmer on a pebble beach than it is a big open sandy beach in my experience. So while I was yapping away there, I've popped in some of these trees and they are quite distinctive. They, they've got long, slender, straight trunks and then the foliage is right at the top. I don't know what type of tree they are, but they're quite unusual for this area, for Devon. I haven't seen them around too much. Um, and for the most part, I've been using the same green that I used for the hedgerows. So, um, but it's all about sort of how I put the brush down just to kind of think about the mark making. Try and I try to make a mark with the brush when I'm just when I'm painting a tree, which is going to have a little bit of randomness in it. So I will be very conscious about the angle at which I put the brush down and I'll make sure I vary that 
as I move from left to right across the tree line. I'll also vary the pressure that I apply. I'll also vary the orientation of the brush. And sometimes I'll kind of push the brush against the bristles. And I'll generally speaking have quite a bit of paint on the brush as well. So it's not too watery and I'm not doing dry brush. So because when you kind of put a soft blob of paint down, it kind of does its own thing a bit. And that helps create a random texture and a random block of tone and colour. Now for the cliff face is very distinctive red cliffs uh, on this beach. So I've mixed in some of the alizarin crimson, not too much, but definitely some with the cadmium yellow to give me a pale orange and then added some white and then probably just a little touch of the blue. And as I'm applying the paint here, I'm being you know fairly careful, but I'm also just trying to include a little bit of texture. So you can see I've got a little bit of white uh, showing on the brush there and that's kind of automatically mixing in. So the paint isn't mixed too thoroughly. So that automatically creates a little bit of variation. Uh, and it's a lot quicker to do that than um, you know, try and paint in every little nook and cranny. And really, you don't want to do that anyway, in my opinion, if you're painting distant cliffs. You want to hint at the texture, but you definitely don't want to describe it because it's too far away. Although in real life, you can proactively think I'm going to look at the texture of that cliff. When it comes to painting it and making it seem distant, you don't want to do that. So a few seconds ago, there was a small time jump of a few seconds. I blocked in the lower section of the cliff and you can see now I'm sweeping in a pale grey and moving around the line work of the um, of that sweep of beach that I put down earlier, letting that blend into the paint, sweeping right across that parasol and that person I drew there. So what I'm trying to do is just in the same way I blocked in the sky, I've got a block in the beach, but the beach, as you can see, I'm, I'm sat right on these pebbles. and You can see the multitude of colors and shapes I've got there. And when you look out ahead, you know, it's a it's impossible to paint it. Basically, you know, there's millions upon millions of pebbles and colors and shapes and things. So what I tend to focus on initially is just trying to create a sense of you know, a base tone, a sense of perspective. So you can see that the sweeping line helps create a sense of perspective. It leads the eye off into the distance. The brush strokes I've put down most recently and that I'm about to do in a moment, they're forming an inverted V. It might not be a perfectly inverted V, but they are acting as perspective lines and equally me blending the paint into the, the watercolour marker leaves some of that showing. So I've still got some perspective lines there from the original drawing. And the blending of the marker into the paint adds that bit of randomness, just like I was talking about with the cliff face. So when you've got an incredibly complex expanse of colour and texture, I find it best to just sort of think, OK, well, if none of that complexity was there, what would I have? So if it wasn't complex and, it, and you just sort of magically concreted the beach and, and, and you know, had, did it in such a way it was a completely smooth surface, it might look like something I've got there in front of me on the paper now. That said, we don't want to leave it just dull and grey. So I'm introducing some more colours. And the great thing is when you've got tons of colours there, you can be free with your colour choices. You don't have to try and match it exactly. So I'm putting in a little bit of purple now, sweeping that in wet in wet, but still being quite conscious of the direction of brush stroke. So I, I want to maintain some of that subtle hint of perspective. So the foreground brushwork kind of leads the eye off into the distance, but changing the color up now so that it's gone a little more towards the brown, the orangey brown. So I'm cheating a little bit. You see those strips of color, they're not really there. But by having the pale gray on the right sweeping round in that kind of distorted C shape, as in the letter C shape, and then the blue line of the watercolor mark echoing that, then I've got a straight line of pale purpley pink, then the orangey brown coming down. And now I'm putting in a darker purple. It's not really a representation of what's there, it's certainly not exactly, but I'm putting in these uh, different coloured strips 
to give a bit of variation, but keeping the shapes so that they taper off into the distance. And now that the paint on my brush is starting to run out a little bit, now I am using a little bit of dry brush, or as dry as it can be, because I'm going through still wet paint, to, sorry, I just hit my finger on the laptop there, um, to just add a little bit of texture to the beach surface. And now back in with a much paler version of that grey colour to in part obscure the um, some of the drawing and just make it a little bit clearer what's going on over there but also just to you know give a hint of some of the light catching and the the pebbles are a, a little paler in that section as well So I really wish I'd discovered, I think I've probably said in previous videos, but I, it comes to mind every time I do it or every time I watch back the footage of me painting at a beach. Um, I really wish it's something I'd pursued, you know, much earlier in life, uh, plein air painting and, you know, just working at the coast. You know, I mean, I was, you know, I was doing other things that I was enjoying. So, you know, you can't, you can't do everything. And I was doing plenty of art. But uh, I should have done more outdoor stuff uh, many years ago because I really, really love it. It's, it's so much fun and uh, so relaxing as well. So now just dragging the paint across the undercoat of colour that I've got there to um, add a little bit of texture to that bank of pebbles, which is going down quite steeply towards the water. So you can see across the entire painting at the moment, I haven't really painted you know, anything individually. I haven't painted an individual leaf or even an individual tree. I haven't painted an individual hedge as such, or and I certainly haven't done an individual pebble. So we're just kind of building up a framework and a, and a, and a foundation onto which I can then apply selective areas of detail and key features. Now you notice I'm using a flat brush and that's generally speaking my go-to um, when I paint. Not, not always, especially if it's watercolour, I might use a round mop and um, I do enjoy using a big round brush for acrylic from time to time although that's pretty rare these days but the flat's really good because you can you can switch between a narrow line a small mark and a big swathe of color you know within less than a second just by changing the angle of the brush okay so having covered the entire paper with paint now now i can start to make adjustments here and there so First thing, come in with a darker purple for the pebbles near the water there, because it's difficult to see from the reference I'm showing you, but um, things do get quite a bit darker there. And then just like I was saying a moment ago, I was able to switch just then from a, a wide brush stroke to some narrow brush strokes and noticed I, that I angled them at the angle of the incline of the pebbles. So almost every mark I make I'm doing something similar there, but with the brush applied in the normal way. Almost every mark I make is designed to add a contour in some way or give some extra information beyond colour. So there's always a drawing element with, with most of what I do. Now I'm probably fiddling a little bit more than I need to with the water because the water in, in this particular painting, it's, it's almost incidental, I would say. Um, it may not, be, may not appear to be the case here at this stage of the painting, but uh, when all the people are in, really, I want the focus to be on the people. So 
with the benefit of hindsight, I think I could have left those dark marks out of the water and perhaps even the little bit of white that I've put in along the edge there. But nevertheless, you know, no harm done, I don't feel. So I'm just adding in a little bit of variation and colour with a green, which is pretty close to a pure blue, actually. Um, and I'm doing that to just add a little bit of texture and a little bit of variation in the colour, but also blue is obviously a cool colour and cold colours tend to push things back off into the distance. But really the main source of an illusion of depth in this painting, I'm hoping is going to come from the perspective lines that I've mentioned already, and then also the people, because, you know, we're obviously evolved to recognise faces and people. It's a very strong instinct. And so if you've got somebody, you know, in the foreground of a certain size and then as people go off into the distance in the painting, they're going to appear to become smaller and smaller and smaller. That's going to be the main visual cue, which I hope will create a sense of depth within this picture. Now, this more bluey green um, is also going to act. I think I might have added a little bit of uh, red in there as well, actually, to make it a little more purpley. Um, but that's adding in a little bit of a shadow colour because the canopies of the, of the trees are obviously casting a shadow onto the hedges below. And then here's a perfect example of how I can use quite a big flat brush. I mean, it's not massive, is it? It's only about half an inch uh, wide, but compared to the size of the trees I'm painting, it's pretty big. And you can see that just by touching the the tips of the bristles down onto the paper, I get a nice straight line. But not only that, especially on those three lines that I put down, first of all, you can see there's some lovely variation in the quality of that line because there's uh, a change in the in the width of the line from top to bottom, but there are also little gaps in the line as well. And all of those things help to create a little bit of a sense of distance, but they also make it more convincing, in my humble opinion, as a tree trunk, because you know, we can draw a nice smooth tree trunk, but often, even if it is a smooth, almost cylindrical trunk, there's there are bits of, you know, moss and things growing off of it. So there's all sorts of stuff going on within nature. And the more you can use the randomness of the brush, uh, the better, I feel. Now, in contradiction to what I was saying earlier about painting the, the crevices and things, there are some fairly dark shadows on these cliff, cliff faces. So having put down the base layer I, um, where I did the sort of blended colour and texture. I'm now going against my own advice a little bit and just putting in some texture, but I'm doing it in a dry brush way for the most part. So again, I'm not drawing, you know, individual cracks in the cliff face. I'm just creating a little bit of texture uh, on those cliff faces. But to be honest with you, I think I probably needn't have done that. Back into the um, the shrubbery and the the hedges and things on the cliff top. And then just dragging that same green down with the dry brush effect over the cliff face, because again, uh, on the cliffs of Budley, they're this brilliant red colour. They're very distinctive, as I mentioned before. But yeah, there's all sorts of uh, plant life growing you know, beautiful bright greens against that complementary red. So I've just hinted at that. But really, like like I just said, the, the trees I'm fairly happy with in terms of the level of detail and the amount of, you know, work I've put in. I think I kind of stopped at the right point. The cliffs perhaps uh, went a little bit too far and should have just left them as they are. And I say this, uh, you know, quite a lot in recent videos, I've, you know, and I think artists do it as as a rule. You know, it's about knowing when to stop. And I'm finding more and more and more, as I've said in uh, you know, uh, previous videos, I need to stop earlier on stuff. But I think what happens is I just start enjoying myself. So I start sort of, you know, exploring more and more. But you may remember there was a recent plein air video where I was down at Sidmouth and uh, that one, I really took the approach with this watercolour plein air landscape painting on the beach where I was painting for a bit and I deliberately walked away 
for maybe five minutes and then I'd paint again for five minutes, and then walk away for five minutes. And that really worked well for me. So I think I could probably afford to do the same thing uh, with the acrylics as well. That would be helpful. But, you know, no, no harm done, really. But it's just a general observation looking back at my my work. OK, so what is this big patch of blue? Well, you can't tell from the reference photo because it looks like the most beautiful cloudless day. But there were a few clouds coming in just momentarily, you know, as they as they sailed by and they would cast shadows on the beach. So I'm kind of making up this blue cast shadow from a cloud above and I'm doing it quite deliberately and painting it in such a way that it's going to help me describe the stepped nature of the beach. And again, that's something that doesn't really come across in the reference I'm showing you. But the pebbles at Budley, you, you come in from the water and it's uh, where the tide is at the moment. It's a very steep incline. And then you come up onto a plateau and then there's another steep incline of pebbles, then another little uh, horizontal section and then like kind of a rounded lump, which I'm painting at this very moment. And then up into the purple on the left, it kind of sweeps up almost like a skate park ramp a little bit. So by doing that, you know, it's a it's a it's kind of an artistic choice. It's created, I hope, more of a sense of 3D. So the beach has gone from what looked to be almost a flat surface once you come uh, left of the water to now hopefully it's beginning to look more like an undulating surface as you go from left to right. Now, having done that, I'm now doing something similar, but with a darker color. And, you know, you might sort of think, well, you know, perhaps that's a bit uh, counterintuitive to do that. But the idea is the darker color is going to bring things forward, hopefully. And what I'm doing here is having put the first shadow down, it's, it's pr the first shadow is pretty much a strip of constant width. And I did that quite deliberately, as mentioned. But of course, clouds are not just rectangles floating it through the sky, casting perfectly equal width shadows. So in order to break away from that uh, regular shape, the foreground shadow, I've deliberately changed the width quite dramatically but I've still maintained, I hope, that sense of undulation as we go across the, the width of the beach. So apologies for the, the, the shadow I'm casting across the painting now and then. Um, it's simply because I'm sort of moving around trying to you know, lean over the oh, yeah, oh, that was my leg. So so what's happening is I'm sat on the pebbles and having sat there for half an hour, I'm starting to ache a little bit. So I'm trying to stretch my legs out in, in different positions. But anyway, this it's pretty clear now on the part I'm painting. So you can see I'm putting in a pale blue for the parasol or one of the parasols. And when I get to this stage, obviously parasols are artificially made, and in addition to that, they can be pretty much any color you could imagine, but generally speaking, they're fairly bright. So what I'm tending to do is rather than copy the parasols that are there, I'm thinking more about my painting. So for example, the blue I put down for the first parasol is deliberately darker than the sky, but it's also deliberately a different blue to pretty much anything I've used elsewhere in the painting. And then the yellow I just put down is a brighter color so that it contrasts with the blue that I put down just a moment ago. So in a nutshell, what I don't want to have within my painting is just four or five yellow parasols all grouped together and then another patch of red parasols uh, all grouped together and so on. And now we're st starting to think about how can I create this sense of depth? So just did the two parasols on the left and they are clearly parasol shaped. But for those, I just put a couple of little flecks of paint off in the distance and they could, they're brightly colored as well. They could be parasols or perhaps they are um, paddle boards, which are sort of, or surfboards or something like that, or inflatables, which are lent up on the pebbles or on the distant hedge. So already I'm starting to introduce some of these depth ideas, clear shapes over on the left, but then off in the far, far distance, just little patches of colour. So here's another parasol coming in. You can see I've gone with sort of a salmon orange there. And we'll put another one down here 
nearer the water but again I've added more red so I'm just changing the color even if it's not that dramatic every time I do a parasol and in general they're all going to be set up at more or less the same angle because you know the sun is coming in from one direction and generally speaking people are seeking shade underneath these things but there's always going to be a bit of variation in part because some people will be um, you know not using them for that reason or might have left them for a while and when you stick a you know the parasol rod into the pebbles with the best will in the world um, I don't know about anybody else but I can never get it at exactly the angle I want so there's going to be variation so I'm being careful to just have a little bit of variation there as well and uh, I forgot to mention but you can see I've switched to a small filbert brush now and just adding a little bit of a scent or just added a little bit of a sense of light onto that sort of dark gray greeny parasol uh, that I just painted but I'm back in with my watercolor marker now and the reason I do this at this stage is although there's definitely going to be some very loose interpretation and mark making of people off in the distance in a bit within that loose impressionist pattern of marks there need to be a couple of shapes which are very clearly clearly identifiable as people because otherwise um, I'm just going to have a load of random marks so I'm going to need a couple of people which definitely look like people and then hopefully the viewer's mind will then read the rest of the marks as people if that makes any sense you can see I kind of messed up a little bit there with the watercolor marker so I just came back in with a damp brush and softened didn't manage to remove the marks completely but I softened a lot of the watercolor and just spread it around a bit um, to you know approximately delete that mark so decided to come in with a bit of a bolder move and put a deck chair in there and the great thing about painting this subject from life is I mean you can do this with a photo as well to an extent but you know if there's not a deck chair there somewhere on the and, and it, or if there is it's not at the right angle somewhere on the beach there probably is going to be when it's as crowded as it is so I can't remember where I, I sourced this deck chair from but um, you know I have no hesitation about you know moving people around in my painting to where I want them to be even if they're nowhere near that location uh, in actuality so I've got a deck chair and then there's somebody sat uh, on the on the pebbles there and you can see I'm using the watercolor marker to to draw in the the silhouette of the hair and then I've put a little box of, I'm putting a little box or cooler box there next to her Then we've got a chap that I've put in before but I've just added in some legs so he sat in a little deck chair or camping chair so now you can see we're starting to create a sense of depth with the people the lady in the foreground sat on the pebbles is obviously larger than the chap I just drew so already if you just look at that little section of the painting and those two people alone um, for me at least my brain is telling me that guy's further away than, than she is. Now there are also some people down near the water's edge. So I'm going to include a couple of those. And one of the reasons I like drawing with the watercolor marker is it just these marker pens, they really do just glide across the paper, especially if you've already sealed the surface with the acrylic, you know, the, going over dry acrylic. It's really nice to just draw on top of and I feel the mark it makes is more in keeping with a line of acrylic paint than a pencil mark would be so for that reason if the watercolor marker shows in the finished product I feel there's a better harmony in terms of mark making than there would be if I put a pencil line down and left some of that showing not that that's a bad thing to have pencil line showing but um, as I say I just think it works better for me and for my style of painting so we've got a couple down at the water's edge now 
then we need to decide you know where to put um, some more people but very much with beach paintings I think I think the presence of people doing very beach like things you know very beach specific activities like sitting at the water's edge or sitting next to a deck chair or under a parasol or they might be carrying a surfboard whatever it is perhaps more than any other landscape I think um, it, you know it, it helps it it helps convey a sense of, of coastal uh, within the painting so now I'm painting in this colouring in this deck chair the fabric of the deck chair so that looks to be almost pure alizarin crimson And then while I've got that on the brush, I've just added a couple of marks here and there. So I'm starting to suggest some very distant people now. So they're just little dots off in the distance. That little diagonal mark, that line I put on the uh, near the coast, near the near the waterline, I should say, on the bank of pebbles, that's meant to be, um, you know, perhaps a paddleboard or something dragged up onto the pebbles. But we're starting to put in a few heads of people in the midground. And then yellow ochre mixed with a little bit, little bit of alizarin and then quite a bit of white to get uh, a colour which is going to be, you know, approximately appropriate for, um, you know, the, the areas which aren't clothed basically on the people. So the lady on the left has a sleeveless top. The guy down near the water isn't wearing a shirt. So I can just begin to block in. The colors and that color I want to be fairly bright because these people are out in the sun but when they're in under the parasol of course things are going to be a bit more subdued and equally even if they're out in the sun there are going to be some areas which are in shadow so you can see I've painted you see how I've painted in the guy quite carefully the one I drew in the deck chair but now with that same color I've just added a few marks on the left to begin to suggest a multitude of people. And really in real life, if you think about walking through a crowd, if there are hundreds of people, there's no way you can register um, everybody's face. It's just impossible. And, um, you know, I'm sure you've had the experiences I have where you meet up with friends from work after the weekend or something and you, you sort of say, oh, what did you do at the weekend? Oh, well, I went to Budley Salton. Oh, did you? Oh, we were down there. Which day did you go? Oh, Sunday. Yeah, we were down on Sunday. And then you find out you were there at the same time and you find out you were in the same you know, geographical location to within about 20 yards, but you didn't actually see each other. <laughs> um, so you know, the reality of the crowd experience is, you know, you, even if you're proactively trying to recognize lots of people, you can only take in a certain limited number and the rest of them are just in your peripheral vision, your peripheral consciousness. Um, and consequently, you're not taking in the color of their eyes and the style of their hair. And so we can replicate that phenomenon within a painting by having a few things in detail and then a few other things just with little marks. Now, the marks I'm making are a mixture of the mid-tone, but now I've switched to a lighter color. So when I'm looking off at the distant landscape, what I was seeing was, you know, essentially fairly dark silhouettes, but little areas of the body or the person would be catching the light. So I don't need to worry about drawing an individual arm catching the light off in the distance, but there are going to be patches of lighter things. And sometimes those things might not be human. You know, they might be, as I said, a white paddleboard or something, but hopefully those little bits of texture off near the base of the cliffs are starting to suggest the presence of some people there. Whereas before it was completely unoccupied. So really this exercise is, it's a little bit of trial and error. You can see I've gone to more of a pink color now. 
So I'm, I'm looking at the crowd and thinking, well, what colours are there most predominantly? And I've also kept a little bit of white. You see the orange parasol just above that, slightly t above the left hand edge of that. There's a little mark with a fairly dark pink and then a little burst of white. So I'm using that technique of not having mixed the paint too thoroughly on the brush. So I've got more than one colour and that you know, creates interesting marks when you put it down. But now I've gone to sort of a bluey grey and I'm using the edge of the filbert to put in some little vertical or slightly off vertical lines to suggest more and more people milling about, moving around, sitting on the pebbles. So the main thing is to get the orientation of those marks correct and also get the size right. But now having moved to the, the middle ground, I can start to use that same colour to hint at some cast shadows from those parasols or figures lying on the beach. The point is to create a sense of busyness and a sense of activity. So now back in with a darker blue. And now we're beginning to draw in. I'm not sure why I didn't use the watercolour marker here. Probably just because I had the filbert brush on the go um, and I thought it would work okay. But I could have done the same thing here with the, the watercolour marker pen. So we've got a figure standing there facing the water with a hat on. So how many figures have we got actually described so far? We've got the lady on the left by the deck chair. We've got the chap underneath the yellow parasol. Arguably, we've got a guy standing next to the other yellow parasol. We've got the figure I just drew with the hat on and we've got the couple by the beach. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six figures actually drawn and the rest are just marks so far. Coming in with this darker blue, so contrast is obviously important if you want to create a sense of light. Um, if you're working on a white background and you put down a shadow, a cast shadow, you know, next to uh, the outline of an object you've drawn, immediately you can create a sense of light. And you know, the reverse is true, obviously, if you're working on a darker background. And in fact, um, if you haven't tried it before, if you get some, say, purple or quite dark grey sugar paper, um, and then paint on, on top of that with acrylic with, with perhaps a bright yellow. The, the paint will really seem to, uh, to glow. It's really quite a nice effect. It's just an optical illusion, but um, you know, it's worth experimenting with if you haven't tried it before. So coming in with pure white here, adding a stripe to that yellow parasol. And that's going to help create a sense of three dimensions. So logos and things that are, you know, put on, say, the side of a van or wrap around the corner of a van or go over the curved surface of a parasol, whatever it is, it all helps to create a sense of three dimensions because the shape gets distorted as it goes over a bump or around a corner or over a curve. Now, in this particular case, there isn't really a distortion of the shape with um, that white stripe, but it still helps describe the curved surface because the right hand edge of that white patch is a different shape to the left hand edge of that white patch. Just added a few cast shadows and now blocking in the dress that the woman sat on the pebbles is wearing.
and then a little touch of yellow for that bag or cooler or whatever it is at her back. And that links up quite nicely with the yellow parasol, but I don't want to have too much yellow all in one spot, but just those two items is absolutely fine. And in general, it's a good idea to have a bit of yellow on the left, a bit of yellow on the right, perhaps a bit of pink up in the cliffs, a bit of pink down in the foreground, just to get the eye to bounce around a bit, blocking in the figures near the, the waterline now. And now adding some more shadow colours underneath the parasols. So, you know, obviously on, on a sunny day, the whole point of these uh, sh uh, parasols is to provide shade. So it's, it's important to incorporate the effect that they would have within our painting. So a lot of these figures are going to be a near silhouette, not because um, they're backlit or anything, but just simply because they are in shadow. But this figure here, um, just standing on the beach looking out towards the water if there's sort of one focal point of the entire painting i would say that it's this this person and for that reason that's why i've blocked in the shirt as white so i want a reasonable amount of contrast on this figure We'll go with a darker colour for the shorts, though. But we'll get to that in a moment. So some indication of an arm. And then just blocked in the whole lower half of the figure in my kind of uh, in the flesh tone that I'm using today. But then back in. With a dark blue for the shorts. little bit of a highlight on the hat. So in general, I haven't concerned myself too much in this painting with for the figures with uh, highlights, midtones and shadow within one figure. But just a little touch of a highlight there. It, it all helps. And in a bit, I'll add a little cast shadow for that main figure as well, just to just to make it make it look a little more, more realistic. So sorry about my hand covering those two figures at the waterline, but you can see I've just added some yellow to the hair there. So again, I've got that left to right little patch of yellow on the left, little patch of yellow on the right. So at the moment, to sort of summarise what we've got, we've got a very simple treatment of the sky. We've got the distant cliffs and tree line which I've painted quite loosely. And then we had this massive expanse of Pebble Beach, onto which I've put some cast shadows in the foreground to create a sense of undulation. And then I've added some people from the middle ground to off in the distance. And I've painted a half dozen of those 
fairly carefully outlined and, sil or, and or silhouetted. The rest are just little marks, you know, but being quite careful about the size of those marks and the direction of those marks as we go off into the distance. Now, having done that, what I'm doing now is adding a little bit of texture and starting to paint just a few pebbles in the foreground. But, you know, I'm not going to be too fussy about this. I mean, I've seen quite a, quite a bit of art, actually, where people focus on. So, for example, just to the left of the bulldog clip on my pad of paper, if you imagine picking half a dozen pebbles there, you could make a really carefully considered painting after, out of just those half a dozen pebbles because there's you know, really interesting colours going on, interesting shadows and interesting textures. So, you know, just doing a close-up still life of the pe pebbles alone I would say is a worthwhile artistic subject but for my painting that's not what I want to do because if I if I paint a pebble in detail in the foreground it's just going to pull the eye into that pebble and you know it's going to lose the main focus of the painting which is really off in the distance so convention is perhaps to have the most detail in the foreground of a painting and then less in the background but here I'm trying to do the reverse for the most part. So the de most detailed area at the moment I would say is the middle ground, uh, you know, possibly the, the background trees as well, but I want the eye drawn to that sense of distance and then the foreground is really there just to lead the eye in to those distant people and the distant landscape. But the reason I'm adding some indication of pebbles in the foreground is it doesn't really look at all like a pebble beach in the foreground. So in the same way that I've used just very simple mark making to suggest the distant people, I'm going to use pretty simple mark making to suggest foreground pebbles. So what I'm doing is picking out slightly enhanced versions of the colours I'm seeing around me as I sit on the beach. And I'm using the, uh, the brush to just create little crescent shapes. I think I'm actually using a filbert here, about a one inch filbert. So it's, it's got a rounded end. So it, it's quite a nice way to automatically create a little curved arc of paint. So I've used some white, some blue, some brown, some purple and you know, just experimenting with different shapes of mark and different sizes of mark, but trying to be fairly careful not to make any of them too precise and also not to lose that sense of different levels and that step nature of the foreground as well. I don't want to undo what I did with the shadow work um, by being too haphazard. So it's a balance between you don't want everything to look like a perfect array, but you don't want it to look just like a mess of marks either. So I actually ended up adding a few swathes of yellow in the foreground because I felt the colour scheme was a little bit too cool and didn't really reflect the sunny nature of the day. But there's the, the scene that I was inspired by. Obviously people have moved over the course of the hour or so that I was painting. It's probably more like an hour, like an hour and 20 minutes or something like that. Hope you enjoyed this trip to the beach with me for the plein air adventure. And I hope to see you next Sunday for the next episode of the Sunday Art Show. Please remember to check out the finished painting. You can click on a link in the description of this video. That takes you to my website and you can zoom in on the painting. You can look at the brushwork in, in detail just by clicking on that image on the website. And then if you want to buy a print or something like that, then obviously that's all available too. If you've got any questions, leave me a comment below. Either way, hope to see you next Sunday for the next episode of the Sunday Art Show. Thank you very much for watching.